officer at Integral Care. And I'll be your moderator for today's panel discussion. And Integral Care supports adults and children living with mental illness, substance use disorder, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you so much for joining us. We're honored to present today's community forum in collaboration with Caritas of Austin, whose mission is to prevent and end homelessness for people in greater Austin. And we're so glad to have um, Joe Catherine uh, Quinn here with us, um, who is the executive director of that organization. Homelessness is a key issue facing our community. Rapidly increasing property values or reducing the availability of affordable and permanent um, supportive housing and contributing to homelessness. The pandemic created economic uncertainty, increasing issues like domestic violence, both of which are causes of homelessness. The list goes on. In May, the Ending Community Homelessness Coalition estimated that on any given day this year, more than 3,000 people experienced homelessness in Austin, Travis County. But there is hope, and that's why we're here today. In our community, a home is more than four walls. It's the foundation for health and well being. I'm honored to welcome our panelists for today's discussion, and I'll introduce them now. Shirley was born in Austin. She enjoys reading, watching TV, and spending time with family and friends. She has three children, 14 grandchildren, and two great grandchildren. Shirley experienced homelessness for five years before securing housing in June of 2020. Thanks for being with us, Shirley. Megan Podowski is the Deputy Director of Rapid Rehousing and Integrated Services for Caritas of Austin. She's worked within the homeless response system in Austin since 2008, holding a variety of positions over the years and gaining rich experience working with diverse populations, multiple social service contracts and varied funding streams. And last but not least, Ruth Ahern is the Practice Administrator of Housing and Healthcare for Homeless Initiatives with Integral Care. Ruth has been involved in the field of housing and homelessness services for the last seven years. She oversees the supported housing support services teams, as well as our outreach and engagement teams working with individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you all for being with us today. We'll start with a panel discussion and move to audience questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes. As best we can, we've incorporated questions we already received and put them into our program. Please type any questions that you have into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can. In case we run out of time, please include your email so we can follow up with you. We are recording today's forum and streaming on Facebook. So let's get started. We're gonna start with the causes of homelessness as this is an issue that's often misunderstood across the community. Life storms like catastrophic illness, domestic violence, as I mentioned, divorce, bankruptcy, and natural disasters can contribute to homelessness. I'd like to start with Shirley and ask her, will you start us off and share your experience with us? Yes. Um, my homelessness came from, um, I lived with my significant other for 30 years and in the 15th of, 2015 in June, he passed away with cancer. So I had to move out of the apartment and I have family members and everything, but you know, you don't really wanna be a burden on your family. So I chose to be homeless. I have a son that would have welcomed, welcomed me into his home at any time. You know, but I just couldn't put the burden on my kids because I'm supposed to take care of them, not them take care of me. So I chose to live on the streets and I experienced some really, really bad things. But anybody can be homeless, like she said. But my story is I chose to be there because I was drugging and I was drinking. And out there, you know, you pretty much can get what you want, you know. Um, I never walked around and begged people for money or nothing like that because it was given to me. Like most of the homeless people down there, I pretty much knew and they knew me. So they opened their arms to me and helped me out a lot. But also the resources there, uh, the Trinity Center helped me with clothes and hygiene and stuff like that and then that was the arch where you could go in and shower and keep yourself clean if you wanted to 
and then um, Caritas fed us, you know, once a day at the place where you go and eat the soup kitchen that we call it. But my story is being homeless is, is a really, really bad thing. It hurts. You have sleepless nights. You don't know where your next meal coming from. You don't know if it's going to rain, sleet, or snow. So you have to be prepared at all times to move uh, to safety. You got to kind of like sleep with one eye open. So I just say, I mean, now today they have so many resources that you can reach out to and get help. So, but you have to reach out to them because they're not going to come to you like they came to me. You know, I had three people that just stayed on my back and got me to where I am today. And, and that was the 3M team. It was Taylor. She's no longer with us. But Tony and Gladys, Miss Gladys is still here. And I see them once a week. They come into my home. They love my home. And uh, they're there when I need them. They, they're more support. So I just want to say that and thank you. Shirley, thank you so much for being willing to be with us today and congratulations on your um, fantastic story on the news last night and sharing thank your you. um, experience with the M3 team. Ruth, can you share information about the relationship between homelessness and trauma? Yes, ab absolutely, Ellen. Um, first of all, thank you all for, for having us here today and especially Shirley for um, just being so open and, and sharing your story. Um, and I, I think you even heard there in, in Shirley's story a bit about uh, the link between trauma and, and homelessness. So yeah, here in Austin, there's a significant number of individuals who are experiencing homelessness um, who have reported that their homelessness was caused by trauma or abuse. Um, and when you, you know, stop and think about it, we, you know, you can see how fleeing an abusive situation or a domestic violence situation, um, a person likely doesn't have any other option than to leave behind their belongings or their support system, um, their jobs, their livelihood, right? Um, but being homeless is also a traumatic experience. Um, when you lose your home, um, that's often accompanied, accompanied by just losing your community. Um, again, losing your belongings, losing your sense of safety. Um, I think Shirley, uh, again, uh, um, really shared this in her story, um, you know, living on the streets, you can be exposed to a lot of high risk kind of situations. Um, either they, they could occur to you or that you could just witness them happening. Um, the ongoing uncertainty of where to find food or shelter, um, for example, just keeps a, an individual in that kind of constant state of, of anxiety um, of how they're going to get their basic needs met. So I think that's just why it's so important that the services we provide as, as part of the homeless response system we need to be trauma informed. Um, we really need to understand that, you know, and these you know folks that we're working with have experienced trauma. Um, we need to help them feel safe um, and and help them, you know, really have a choice um, in in how how they you know, receive services and support to move forward. Thank you, Ruth. And yeah, in Shirley's case, obviously the death of her loved one and then losing her apartment that. Is it, you know, that right there is a great example of trauma and how it can really impact someone's life. Um, Megan, would you share a little bit about the systemic issues that contribute to homelessness? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of them. Um, I'd first like to start with thanking Shirley so much for sharing your story. Um, you provide a lot of hope for people out there, and it's it's really inspiring to have you on um, with us. And then thank you to everyone that's participating. That's also super inspiring to see that that everyone wants to be a part of the solution and learn how how to end homelessness. So yet yeah, the systemic um, issues that have contributed to homelessness, absolutely. I think it's kind of it's helpful to start with a brief, um, maybe a historical perspective of what's happened over the last several decades in regards to to homelessness in in the United States. So in the, the mid 1970s, we saw a decline in federal housing assistance, and then we saw um, an increase year over year in the cost of living. Um, and then coupled with that in the late 1970s, there was the mass uh, deinstitutionalization of mental health hospitals. Um, when they deinstitutionalized everyone, they did not balance that with creating any community-based resources. Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, there was an over-reliance on shelters and criminal justice systems to kind of address uh, mental health um, and homelessness. 
as we moved into the 90s, um, cities, uh, not just federally, but actual local cities started developing plans to end homelessness. And then in the late 2000s is really when we started see, seeing the housing first philosophy um, come into our, our interventions. I think in Austin, we really started focusing on, on the housing first intervention um, a little bit late. Um, I think it, we, we started introducing it into our coordinated entry system in like 2013, 2014 and, and having those discussions. Um, so, so in addition to um, that kind of historical con context of homelessness, um, the systemic issues that, that lead to homelessness are really, they're multifactored. It's, it's a systemic issue. Um, we have a huge lack of truly affordable housing. I think that a lot of people talk about affordable housing and it's not affordable. Um, we have no federal mandate for livable wages in, in, our, in our state. Um, there's gentrification that's been happening all across of our city, which causes uh, big increases in property taxes, which is pushing out um, generational Austinites out of their homes um, and into shelters or into their cars or living uh, coupled up and uh, doubled up and uh, couch surfing. We also have systemic uh, racism that shows up as a contributing factor of homelessness. And in Austin, the Black and African American population, they only make up about 8% of our, our county population, but are um, overrepresented in our homeless population at about 37%. Um, this disproportionality in homelessness is a direct byproduct of centuries of denied rights. Um, and denied access to socioeconomic opportunities, including housing. I think the biggest takeaway though from this question is that um, we need to stop asking people experiencing homelessness, what did you do wrong? And realize that this is a community-wide issue and we have all played a part in it. And how can we come together as a community um, and truly work on finding solutions to end homelessness? Thank you, Megan. I think that's a great point that this this issue didn't sort of pop up suddenly, um, that it has been decades of um, social and economic policy that have, um, you know, gotten us to the place we are today. And so it's going to take, um, you know, a significant coordinated effort um, across the community um, to get us going in a different direction, which I think has already started and is um, creating a lot of um, hope and optimism for those of us working in the area. Um, cities across the country are using successful evidence-based solutions to ending homelessness. And Megan um, mentioned this in her earlier comments. And one such solution is housing first. Um, and I'd like to go to Ruth and ask her to tell us about the housing first model and what it looks like and how it works. Sure, thank you, Ellen. Um, so housing first is, is you know, first and foremost, it's a proven solution um, for people who've experienced homelessness. Um, it's an evidence-based model that uh, removes barriers to, to individuals moving into housing. Um, so within this model, we work really quickly to move people into housing. And then once they're housed, that's when we offer those really intensive um, wraparound supports. So while doing this, um, it's, it's just really important that we are meeting the person where they are in their journey. Um, a key piece of housing first is client choice. Um, and so that needs to be exercised across, you know, the, the whole um, process of, of becoming housed, right? So we wanna ensure that people have choice in the type of housing um, that they're offered um, and that they are able to move into um, their participation level and support services. Uh, what the model has really shown us is that people are more successful when they are given that opportunity to exercise choice in their housing. Um, and so we are, um, when we're doing really good housing first work, we're person centered, um, we're offering uh, the supports regularly, um, but recognizing that, you know, just depending where people are in their journey, um, they, they may be, you know, focusing on different aspects of their recovery, right? So um, I think I had mentioned earlier that that trauma informed piece of, of the work we do. And I, I think, you know, Megan also alluded to that as well, where we're really focusing on, um, you know, understanding what people have experienced um, and then, you know, letting them take the lead in, in what their recovery looks like. Um, and then just being there to provide all of those supports to help them be successful. 
So Ruth, will you just um, share about the, the issue of choice? Because it's not only like just an important part of respecting people um, and their um, opportunity to have choice, but it's also um, in terms of federal rules and regulations, that's something that we have to follow in providing housing. Is that correct? Um, Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So in terms, Sorry. In terms of choice, housing choice, there's rules in um, from the from HUD around providing ch choice for people when they um, are moving into housing. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure if there's a particular rule and maybe Megan can um, speak to this, but in, in terms of providing housing first services, um, absolutely. What we, what we want to do is um, provide options to individuals, right? And so, it's not, um, and I think we're going to get into this a little bit more, what housing first is versus, you know, what it isn't. Um, it's not a residential treatment program or anything along right. the lines, right? So individuals who sign a lease um, and they have to follow that lease first and, and foremost. Um, and so then they've got the protections of, you know, um, of the various uh, federal housing um, laws um, that, right. we, that we have. Yeah, does that answer your question, Ellen? I'm sorry. Yeah, kind of. It, sorry, okay. I um, kind of bungled the question, but that's okay. okay. Um, so tell, Megan, will you talk to us a little bit about the types of barriers that people face when it comes to housing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest ones, um, when we start the housing process um, with individuals that come into our rapid rehousing programs or our supportive housing programs, um, one of the first things that we do is um, is we we pull what it's a criminal credit criminal rental history so that we um, are comprehensively aware of where people's barriers are. Nothing that shows up on that history is going to screen someone or make out of programs or make them ineligible for programs. It's a way to make the housing process far more efficient because if when we pull that history, it shows three evictions. We're not going to apply at a certain property that says no evictions. Um, the majority of housing in Austin uh, says no evictions, no rental debt, no broken leases, no criminal history. Uh, you better have a great credit score. Um, and, and as we know that that's, that's I mean, that's, um, that's a huge barrier when people are exiting homelessness. Um, broken leases uh, come up all the time when someone is fleeing domestic violence. Um, a lot of people do not... Um, they're in a, a, a situation that they need to get out very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, we don't initiate tenants' rights in those situations and, and a broken lease is a result of that. Um, so really simple things like an eviction, or like I said, broken leases, um, petty crimes. Um, it, there are several properties that, that have this uh, screening criteria of a pattern of behavior that could be a couple um, misdemeanor charges, um, and they can deem that a pattern of behavior and screen someone out very quickly. As we all know, Austin is a highly competitive rental market. Um, units come in and out of the market very, very quickly. Um, and, and so someone, uh, uh, a property that includes that in their screening criteria, uh, which is more often than not, um, it, it screens out our population. Um, I think probably if we're looking at the, the people experiencing homelessness in, in Austin, um, less than half of them would be eligible for housing uh, with traditional screening criteria. You also have that properties can also require exorbitant income requirements, making two and three times the rent, even if, they're, if the um, applicant is coming with a voucher that's going to pay 100% of their rent. Um, so it's because of the rental market, because we don't have deeply affordable units um, and at large scales, it's, it makes it very, very difficult to get into housing on your own, unless you're coming with, um, uh, and, and what a housing first provider does is they come as an advocate and a partnership with that client. And we go forth and create large scale partnerships. And we talk about and educate our, um, our community and the Austin uh, Board of Realtors and the Austin Apartment Association. It's really a community wide effort that is gonna have to come together to end homelessness. And that's where we see successes is when those entities and those for-profit entities come together and support us uh, and we can fill those vacancies really quickly. Megan, I think you're making a great point and sort of building on your earlier remarks about systemic issues, right? So a lot of the um, requirements around housing 
or what contribute to homelessness because once someone's on the streets, it's so it's almost impossible not to break the law and get that criminal history. And then that creates a cycle where it's very challenging to then, um, you know, move, you know, move to a different place. Um, so this is definitely a, an area that's, um, you know, just so challenging. Um, one thing around the um, relationships, I, I think it's important to understand is, for example, a lot of our organizations have landlord outreach teams, and that is a dedicated effort to identify landlords that will work with clients and with organizations to reduce homelessness. And so um, there are a lot of a lot of landlords out there who are working with our agencies and we're so grateful to them. We need more of them, but grateful to them for working with us. So Shirley, um, as Ruth mentioned, Housing First is not only a safe place to live, but it also includes support services. And can you talk a little bit about the support services that you've received and how that has, um, what that has meant to you? Uh, yes, um, well, um, I've, I've received a lot of support. I have community court, uh, Mrs. Bond Boss, that's my, caseworker too. She's the one that um, kind of like got me started into housing along with the M3 team. And uh, the M3 team is awesome. They're there for my support. They help me with my medical, with my dental. They're there for my psych, you know, for my, my meds. They help me to get um, help with a psych doctor. That's what we call them, a psych doctor. Um, Angelica is awesome. I see her and talk to her like uh, every six weeks or so. And she got me on my meds to where um, I have real, at first I had real bad mood swings and I would lash out at people. Well, of course, because I was homeless and I was angry, you know. So, but she's got me on meds now that keeps my moods real even. Um, Dr. Mercer is my physician. He, uh, I have blood pressure, I have asthma, I have COPD. I have quite a few uh, illnesses that I, I didn't know I had until I went to the doctor. So I was really slowly killing myself, not knowing that I needed medication at the time. But the M3 team, Tony makes sure that I have my medication. You know, he uh, books my doctor's appointments and everything for me. Right now, we're working on dental, helping me to get dentures. Um, they make sure that my bills are paid. Uh, if I need food, they're there. I mean, they just, there. if you need help, like I say, you have to ask them. Then we meet once a week so they'll know where I am and what I do need. So they're always on top of their job as well as I'm on top of it. Because, you know, when I'm, they help me to get my glasses, I mean, you know, I have cataracts now, so they're, they're gonna be there. I have, they help me to get my benefits started. They uh, help me to get Medicaid to where now I have to have, have surgery on my eyes for cataracts. They're there to book my appointments. They hooked me up with Metro Access to take me to and from my doctor's appointment. So, I mean, they, they're they just there for me and they give me a lot of support. And um, they was talking about, well, Shirley, we done did almost everything and we done, I done met everything that they could do for me. So, you know, of course they have to let me go so they can help another person. And I understand that but they're not quite ready to let me go yet because we still got a little bit of job to do, but I'm just glad that they're here for me. And like I say, whoever's out there listening, listen to somebody, this is Sweet Cake. That's my nickname, everybody know me by that. Just reach out to these people and they will help you. Thank you. Shirley, thank you so much. It really sounds like life-saving services that they provided. Yeah. Um, in so many ways and have really created um, that foundation that you needed um, to get to a really different place. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, housing communities with intensive um, support services um, save our community a considerable amount of public resources. 
and Integral Care recently completed a 12-month analysis of, of our 50-unit permanent supported housing community terrace at Oak Springs. Ruth, can you tell us a little bit about that analysis and what it revealed in terms of cost savings? Sure. Um, I'll just briefly start with, with a little information about Terrace at Oak Springs. Um, as Ellen mentioned, it's our 50-unit apartment complex um, on the east side of Austin, and we opened back in November of 2019, so we've been open for a couple of years now. Um, and we've, um, you know, working with our local coordinated entry system, um, as well as very closely with the VA, uh, we've moved um, individuals in who have been experiencing chronic homelessness, um, as well as having a, a disabling condition. Half of those um, have uh, our veterans, um, and our, our complex has um, project-based vouchers and, a, and an intensive um, on-site support services team. Um, and again, we, we utilize a, a housing first model there at, at Terrace at Oak Springs. So um, through this one year return on investment analysis, uh, we ended up seeing a minimum annual savings of over $14,000 per person per year um, on different social, medical, um, criminal justice and, and other emergency services costs. Um, so one example of that is for individuals um, who have resided at, at Terrace at Oak Springs for a year, um, they reduced their emergency room visits by 51%. Um, um, and that saved approximately, you know, it was over $70,000 um, in emergency uh, room visit services. Um, so when we scale that up, that, that single 50 unit apartment complex um, ended up saving our community almost um, $725,000 um, just in our first year of operation. Um, and I think again, I mean, you all can listen to me, but listen to Shirley. Shirley, Shirley, I think is just really, you know, she's, uh, illustrating how important all of this is. You know, I know she was just talking about the, the medical support she received from her team and behavioral health care support. And um, again, you know, the, the housing first model, it's, it's difficult to do all of those things when you're homeless. Um, Shirley was just sharing about needing cataract surgery. How, how could that happen if you were living on the street? How could you um, manage to safely, you know, take care of a lot of these medical needs when you're living under a bridge, right? So um, I think it just, again, illustrates the importance of quickly getting folks off the street into housing. Um, and then these teams are able to really wrap around care um, and um, people have a safe place to stay where they can start addressing a lot of these, um, these needs. And again, Shirley, Shirley illustrated that perfectly. Thanks, Ruth. And, and some of the needs are complex, right? So people Absolutely. have multiple co-occurring um, conditions, you know, including mental health issues, I mean, substance use issues, and then chronic health conditions. And um, so having those teams that have this specialty uh, care approach where they can really um, work with someone to address all those needs is so important. Yes. So I know one question that's always on everyone's mind is what is the process for getting into supportive and affordable housing in Austin Travis County for people who are experiencing homelessness? And Megan, I wanted to see if you could share a little bit about that process and how it works. Sure. Yeah, I think something helpful to understand is the way it used to be. So the way it used to be uh, was uh, not a coordinated effort. Um, people experiencing homelessness, it was really, like, people that got services were people with phones, people that hung out in, in the, uh, a certain area in Austin that were very low, like, had very accessible to services. There were pockets of the most vulnerable people that were living um, further out in our community that didn't have access to services, that were experiencing uh, domestic violence, that didn't have access to phones and couldn't call nonprofit providers um, at 8 a.m. when the phones opened and said, I need services. So it was very disjointed. It was very siloed. Um, we were operating in vacuums. We weren't really coming together. Um, there was not much of a continuum of care. Um, what it has transitioned to is the coordinated entry system. So the goal of the coordinated entry system is to have people that are trained in assessing people experiencing homelessness um, spread all throughout the city. Um, at lots of different local service providers in hospitals, on um, uh, health street, street outreach teams, on healthcare teams that can assess. So the goal is to anyone who's experiencing homelessness should be assessed um, through the coordinated entry system. And then with that list that of uh, that pool of people who need housing, 
um, then we prioritize that list based on need and vulnerability. So, uh, and we prioritize them for housing first pro housing programs. Um, and uh, recently it has transitioned as we've been doing this since what, 2014, I think is when we really kicked off the coordinated entry system. Is that right? Um, 2015 was more robust. More agencies over the last couple of years have been participating in that system. It's now mandated by like most providers um, and our funding sources because it creates equity, it creates access. Um, it opens up a lot of opportunities to, to these very limited resources and very valuable resources so that everyone can have access to them. Um, and but what came we've we've learned the learned things over the last six, seven years. Um, and it was identified that the what we were using, the assessment that we were using to prioritize people, it was called the, the VI, it was the vulnerability index. Um, and we identified that there was there was a gap in the people that were getting access and rising to the top of that prioritization list. Um, and so through a process um, of people that uh, a, a group was pulled together um, of people that have experience in homelessness and just equity advocates in our community and in our, in our service providers and a new tool has been adapted and it's called the Austin Prioritization Index. It just rolled out maybe a month ago um, and it was take, it was created specifically for um, the city of Austin. Um, so I know that it's focused on um, creating um, or reducing the disproportionate amount of people of color and minorities that were not getting access to services. Um, and so it's uh, hopefully this this tool will will lead to, to greater access and opportunities, but I think we'll continue to learn and assess um, and, and get feedback on it as well. But that's kind of the, the overall way that, that you get access to, to housing services. So once you complete that assessment, a referral is sent out to 15, 20 service providers. Um, when someone has an opening on their within their programs, we pull from that list based on need. Great, Megan, thank you. And it does sound like we've made some pretty significant improvements in the last few years as a community um, coming together. So homelessness is solvable when we work together. Um, and what are some of the collaborations happening between housing and homelessness experts, government and community leaders that are going that will create more housing and have a positive impact on Austin and Travis County? And Ruth, do you want to talk um, about one of the projects that you're working on? Yes. Um, so one of the new projects that I'm very excited to be a part of uh, is a hotel conversion project, and that is in collaboration um, with the city of Austin, um, as well as the housing authority of um, the city of Austin. Um, so the, the bungalows at Century Park is going to be a new apartment community um, that will be owned by the city of Austin and then managed um, by Integral Care. Um, the project's going to create 60 new units of permanent supported housing. So 50 of those units will have project-based vouchers through the housing authority of the city of Austin. Um, and then uh, 10 units will be for individuals that have tenant-based vouchers. They could be connected to other programs in the community and have a voucher that they're able to, to take to different um, apartment complexes. Um, so very similar to, to Terrace at Oak Springs, we'll have an on-site support services team, um, which will consist of a, a clinically licensed supervisor. We'll have four case managers um, and then two peer support specialists. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with a, a peer support specialist, that's an individual um, who has had lived experience of, um, it could be a mental health um, issue, substance use issue, homelessness. Um, and so they're able really to bring their, their recovery story and recovery lens um, to, to the work uh, with, with the residents. Um, so individuals for this community are going to be identified through the coordinated entry system that Megan was just talking about. And um, we're modeling, you know, this, on um, other successful programs that we've seen around, around the country, as well as um, our own program here, Terrace at Oak Springs and the success that we've had there. So uh, again, I just would really like to thank the, the city of Austin um, as a collaborator on this project, um, as it really wouldn't be, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do it without their support um, and, and the commitment they've made to the community to um, really address the needs of affordable housing, um, and um, the you know, increased support services as well for individuals experiencing homelessness. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, the city's made an incredible commitment to Housing First specifically, and um, it's just so important in this, um, in this effort. 
Megan, can you share a little bit about the new coalition that's coming together um, with support from Travis County? Yeah, um, Travis County has um, allocated significant dollars behind affordable housing uh, that it's very early in the phase right now, but they um, have made a very strong commitment to reducing homelessness through housing. Um, and, and so, and it's through, like you mentioned, a collaboration of service providers, the units will be scattered all across the city in different opportunity areas and providing people with um, some of the most interesting things I saw uh, during the planning phase is that they're prioritizing access to services, access to transit lines, access to healthcare and healthy foods. Um, and it's, uh, but it's, it's bringing together service providers um, led by Travis County, dedicating the, the funding. And um, the, I know the original goals were to, to identify about 300 deeply affordable units, and we're going to significantly um, surpass that goal. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. And I think it, it's um, really amazing to see that, that we're building on uh, the successes that we've seen in other initiatives by bringing collaborations together, which allows the service providers to really lean into our special specializations because we all really serve a different type of priority population, um, whether it's domestic violence or youth um, aging out of the foster care system or reentry populations, uh, veterans and families, but we can all work together and really um, focus on our specialties and, and, and focus on ending homelessness. Yeah, I think that's so true that it really, um, there's a continuum of providers and we each have our um, areas of focus and um, by having all of us working together and alongside uh, one another, we really do create a strong system uh, across the community that can make such a big difference. Shirley, can you talk to us a little bit about what it means to you that our community is creating more housing for people experiencing homelessness? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really happy about that because, I mean, it's, it's been to get cold. And like I said, I experienced being when I was homeless during the winter, I was sick with pneumonia. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Austin is really finally taking a, a really good look at the homeless here. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen homelessness in places that I didn't even know existed. You know, I don't move around a lot, but uh, I'm really glad that there's more funding to help those that want help. Like I said, you have to want help. A lot of people uh, choose to live that way, but I'm hoping that they will grow out of that and reach out and take the help that's out there, the resources that's out there. And, and I'm glad that Austin finally looking at the homelessness for what it is. I mean, because they they want to boot them out. Now they're taking, about, taking them to jail because they're camping out. Well, where in the hell are they supposed to go? I don't understand that. Why, why, why you want to put them in jail? Because the person homeless, they don't have nowhere to go. If you make a move from this spot, then they're just going to move to another spot. You know, so it's a good thing that they have these resources and they have the funders now to help so many more people. Like I said, I have a sister that's out there homeless right now as we speak, but I've tried to help her. So I think she just want to be there. But I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue to talk with her and try to pull her in so that she can get help and maybe get a rip of her head like me. And, and I think it's awesome that y'all creating all of these new programs. Just fall through with them. You know, say what you mean. Be there, you know, and put yourself in our place, you know. Don't just give us money or resource. Spend time with us. Talk to them and let them know that you are there for them and all the resources that you can give to help them. And I really want to thank y'all for bringing all of this here, the resources together. I thank y'all and awesome people. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shirley. I think you're um, leading, uh, leading into my next part, which is that I know when we um, talk with folks, they always want to know what they can do. And you've started giving us some great examples, and that is to you know, really um, be with people where they are and um, help them, you know, recognize uh, that we're all in this community together and we need to help one another. 
Um, so I'd love to hear what, um, what folks can do to help us in this effort to end homelessness across our community. Um, Megan and Ruth, do you all wanna talk a little bit about what some of the opportunities are? Sorry, I'll, Megan, why don't you go and then Ruth, you follow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think Shirley nailed it. Um, I think just paying attention and being present with people and making eye contact and having conversations uh, with our neighbors that, and that are experiencing homelessness and then also educating your neighbors that are in housing about um, the issues related to homelessness. And, and the more that we can um, to just create conversations um, and then to be with people on, on an intentional level and to, to, to find out who they are and what they want and what their goals are and how we can support them in that. I think that, that goes a really long way. Um, I mean, beyond that, um, we all have gaps in our grants. Um, and so I think find we, have, um, and the, I would think that on all of our websites, you can find wish lists um, that fill those gaps in those grants. Um, like move-in kits. We recently in, in our youth program, we have uh, lots of babies being born. Um, so welcome home kits for babies and those costs do not end at once you move into housing. Diaper, you need diapers for years, right? Uh, so, uh, and that's expensive. Um, so I think stuff like that, that, that can help people transition and, and really, um, move into their home and create a home and not just a transitional housing place, but like hanging art up on the walls and um, decorating and, and those, those moving kits are just amazing. And it, and it shows a connection from the community to the people exiting homelessness and that there are people there that care about them. Thanks. Ruth, anything to add? Yes, and, and I'll also say some of the same things because I think it's important and I'm going to repeat them over and over. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, treating people who are experiencing homelessness with dignity, um, with compassion, um, make eye contact with people you're walking by, engage with them. Um, they are your neighbors. They're your neighbors if they're in your neighborhood. Um, they're just unhoused. Um, it's, I think it's also really important that we are involving people with lived experience of um, homelessness in decision-making. Um, I am the, the vice chair of our local leadership council and we have done a lot of work to um, work on our governance within um, our local continuum of care to ensure that voices of people who are currently homeless um, or who have experienced homelessness in the past are, are heard. Um, and are at the table when we are making um, policy decisions and, and decisions regarding funding and programs. Um, and I think Megan uh, talked about this, but you know, really do get educated about the issues. Um, there are a lot of local um, and, and state policies that are being made um, regarding you know, individuals experiencing homelessness. So there's a lot of resources locally. You can, you can check out ECHO's website, um, our, our local uh, continuum of care agency. Um, statewide, like the Texas Homeless Network has a lot of information. National um, groups like the National Alliance to End Homelessness um, just have a lot of information and data regarding, regarding this issue. And so um, I, I would encourage people to, to um, just learn more um, about, about this issue. Um, and, and then similar to what Megan also stated, you know, when we opened Terrace, um, it was so wonderful for our residents to have community groups come in. Um, we had, um, you know, local churches and restaurants um, coming and making holiday meals and, um, you know, donating food and, and things along those lines. And it just makes people feel um, integrated into their community, um, feel like they're welcome there as, as part of the community. And so I think any opportunities like that that arise um, are, are just wonderful ways to, to welcome, you know, new people into the community and show that, so that we care um, and, and that we're happy that they're uh, a part of our neighborhood. Great, thanks Ruth, Megan, Shirley, I appreciate it. Um, so after the forum, we will be sharing information on um, ways to help and resources. And so that's the end of the formal um, program and we're gonna turn to the Q&A at this time. And there are a lot of questions. 
So I'm just kind of scanning those now to see uh, what the best way is to kind of uh, create continuity and get to some of these questions. Um, so I think there's a couple of um, questions about, so can we go back to coordinated entry system and who, how, did, how is it decided who gets access to limited housing resources? So following up on that um, discussion earlier, um, so once someone completes the assessment and they get on the list, then how is it decided who has access to limited housing resources? And I'll, so, Megan or Ruth, either of you. Yeah, because we both, like both of our agencies participate in the coordinated entry system. Um, I can talk about it from like a, a rapid standpoint, if Ruth, if you want, I mean, it's all, the prioritization is the same. It's based on vulnerability, the higher the score, the higher the vulnerability, the, uh, the faster you're gonna get pulled for a housing program. Um, it is a living list. So as new people, so just because you, you uh, were number 700 on the list and we don't go based on numbers, when you completed your assessment, um, every time someone uh, is identified as experiencing homelessness in Austin, that list moves and it goes up and down. And as our um, providers have openings in our housing programs, we uh, pull all of our referrals from that central location, um, which creates equity in the process because we're not essentially backdooring clients into our programs the, um, without having them go through a prioritization process. Um, and because it's, it, it's really easy to, to hear someone's story and be, feel very connected to it. And every story um, has a human behind it and every single number is an actual person experiencing homelessness and living outside. And so it, um, when you hear those stories, it makes you want to be like, oh, let me, let me find a spot for you in our program. Um, and so instead of doing that, we know that there, we have to create equity in this process and there can't be biases and there can't be subjectivity. Um, and so the coordinated entry uh, system has created more of an objective process for that. So can y'all, um, and Ruth, maybe you could address this, like, can you define vulnerability? Because there's another question about um, related to this uh, for people with mental illness, substance use disorder, um, and whether they, you know, how that priority works, like what prioritizes you to the top of the list? Sure, um, I, I, I'm just trying to kind of simplify it. Um, I, would, I would say risks. Um, are, are things that are like really, that would be considered like risk factors, right? So, so yes, yeah, so someone who has a lot of chronic medical health issues, um, behavior health issues or substance use issues, right? So when you add those things on top, that makes um, your, um, your risk um, in terms of being homeless um, and having bad outcomes because of, of um, you know, being on the street, um, that just means you're kind of higher at risk, right? Um, and so it could be um, health related conditions, it could be individuals that have a lot of contact with um, criminal justice involved um, folks, um, it could be people who, um, you know, have don't have any income or are more likely to be exploited um, by individuals that are um, um, on the street um, as well or, or that might take advantage of them. Um, I don't, I would encourage folks to, to um, learn more about the, the Austin Prioritization Index because part of the, you know, that creation of the new tool was also just looking at some of those vulnerability factors that are um, really specific to our community, right? So um, also just recognizing the impact of gentrification, um, for, for example, um, and recognizing that, um, you know, African Americans in our community are overrepresented. Um, in the homeless response system. And so really trying to address some of those, um, some of those factors as well. I'll okay. say one more thing about the coordinated entry process, because I think people get this confused a lot. Um, Ruth said it well, that the, it's focused on risk while living outside. The higher the score is not an indicator by any means about how successful you are going to be in housing. Um, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be, uh, like that, it, that once you get into housing, you're not gonna be just as successful as anyone else. It is truly focused on the risk that you are um, experiencing while living outside. I think people get those confused. So I just wanted to make that, that clarification. Yeah, and I would, I mean, just to make a, 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 an illustration, right? If, if I always use myself, if I lost my job today, 
um, wasn't able to pay, uh, you know, my, my rent next month. And I was right. My risk overall would be relatively low. I likely could get another job pretty quickly. I don't have two, three, five, 15 years, um, homeless on the street. And so I don't need to be prioritized for an intensive voucher with a lot of around support services. Um, so that's really what we're, we're also kind of looking at. It's like, what type of intervention does somebody need successful or not even successful in housing, but yeah, I guess successful in housing um, because not everyone's going to need the same. Um, and so we want to, we don't want to give these um, our, our, you know, provide really limited resources like me who maybe just was on the street for one night. But I have a lot of other supports I can access and I can quickly, you know, maybe get things back um, where they where they need to be, if that makes some sense. Yeah. So another follow up question to our discussion earlier. There's a question about specific to Terrace, but I think actually this applies to um, housing across the community, and that is the how do leases and evictions work? So as you mentioned earlier. Um, someone might get prioritized to the list that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be successful in housing. So um, Ruth and or Megan both, um, maybe Ruth, if you could talk about how leases and evictions work in this kind sure. of situation. Sure, absolutely. Um, so that is, uh, you know, typically the, the number one things that, that folks have to follow in any housing program is follow your lease. Um, an individual does not have to uh, participate in support services to maintain their housing. Um, they don't have to meet with the doctor if they don't want to. They don't have to meet with their case manager necessarily. Um, but you do have to follow your lease. Um, and so if you aren't following your lease, just like anyone else who signs a lease, there is that you know, legal process. Um, and so if, if um, you know, I'm going to use an example of rent. Um, there is a, a portion of, um, of rent that individuals have to pay. Typically, it's more than 30% of their, of their income. Um, and so if an individual is not paying that, um, then a, a property manager would kind of start the process of reaching out, hey, you're behind on your rent, maybe you have some late fees that are assessed. Um, they may ask you to come in, have a meeting to discuss what's going on, you know, provide a, a payment plan. Um, but if an individual continues to not um, follow that aspect of their lease, um, then they would move forward with, the, with that process of um, you know, perhaps giving a, a non-renewal uh, or a notice to vacate. Um, and then if the person doesn't, doesn't follow through with that, it could lead to eviction. So Ruth, can you talk a little bit about specific to integral care? Like I know we've just been talking about that this week in terms of what do we, like we don't manage the property. We hire out and contract with another company to handle leasing and things like that because that's appropriate because we're a service provider and we don't want right. to mix those relationships, but how would we handle a situation like that for someone? Sure, sure. Um, and what so are some of the things know, we might do? Mm -hmm, yeah, especially when you're, you know, working with the PSH or rapid rehousing program, that's why there's that support services team, right? Um, and, and we always talk about the tension between property management and support services, which is, which is natural. And there's, there's, there are two different roles there. Um, property management is there to, to make sure the lease is followed, maintain the safety of, of the complex. Support services is there to meet with the, the residents and the tenants and um, support them in um, maintaining their housing. So, you know, for, for my teams, for example, um, if somebody was not following their lease, the support services team is, is reaching out um, pretty consistently. Uh, to, in, you know, if it's someone who's maybe not engaged in services, to engage them in services, to talk about their, their housing, um, or if there's somebody who's actively involved, um, you know, really to, you know, just kind of discuss what their, their housing goals are um, and how we can support them in meeting them ultimately. So we provide a lot of, um, of services uh, to, to have some of those difficult conversations um, in terms of Hey, some of these behaviors are, are leading to, to problems with your landlord and, and ultimately what, what are your goals for housing? And if it's to stay housed, then let's talk about some of the behaviors that are going to need to change um, so that you can maintain your, your tenancy here. Um, and then if it's, you know, maybe this isn't the, the best place to live, then what can we do to support you to find um, another option? Okay. So I'm going to move on to get to some other questions. Um... 
So someone's asking whether there is written material for the steps to give to someone who's unhoused, sort of like this process we've talked about today. Is there anything in writing that people can share with someone seeking housing? Um, or is there a reporting process to direct a team to someone that I see all the time? So either like, is there information to give someone who's unhoused and or is there a way to reach out to uh, one of the like M3 or another team sure, to connect yeah. them with someone? Yeah, and I think that's something we can probably add as our, our follow up. Um, we also have um, like Path and Host, which are outreach teams and they've got ways that they can be contacted. Um, and then I do believe there was a, a, a great kind of handout resource that was created um, for individuals experiencing homelessness. I can't remember the agency, but we can, um, uh, find that and, and add a link to that as well. I don't know, Megan, if you've got some other. Yeah, yeah. No, we we hand something out similar at our front desk. I think most local service providers that have um, walk in have have packets, um, and then Austin Austin Echo dot org has. Um, if you go to the coordinated entry um, or experiencing homelessness like drop down, there's about 17 different sites that provide coordinated assessments, um, and so and they've all got locations, times, contact information. I think that's always a, a good place to start too. Um, so there are a couple of questions about specialized populations. So we'll address those after this and share it back with everyone. Um, somebody's asking about how many people are on the um, coordinated assessment list, the coordinated entry list. Does anybody know? I do not echo no. it be the, the best contact for that. Okay, so the Ending Community Homelessness um, Organization would be the group that would manage that information. And like um, I said, it's a living list. So it, you're, it's gonna change every single day. Mm -hmm. People are gonna move onto that list. People are gonna move off of that list as they um, are selected for housing providers. And as people add to, I would say it's 2,500 plus though. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lots of folks. Um, and on average, how long does it take from day of application to actually getting housed? As another follow up on that. They say application, are they talking about like- Yeah, like the day assessment? you um, assess, yeah, I think it's the day, like once you get your assessment done. That's probably also tracked by ECHO. Uh, most service providers are only gonna track from the date that we pulled the referral to the date that we were tracking internally for um, outcomes, like the date that we pull from referral to the date that they're enrolled to the date that their uh, homelessness is ended, um, length of stay in programs, that kind of stuff. Um, so do, yeah. we, do either of you have a sense of how long it takes like for either agency once you do pull that, you know, that person's at the top of the list and then what, how long it takes to get them into housing? Um, for some of our, our rapid rehousing program, um, we track that very closely and it's typically been between 60 and 90 days, um, which is a little higher than what we'd want. Um, I, the, the pandemic left us with some challenges and then also um, units in the community. Um, it's, it's definitely been quite a bit harder to find low barrier units. Yeah. You all see. Similar, yeah, very similar numbers um, around, yeah, 60 to 90 days. Most of our program, the, the smaller programs that have really intense, have smaller caseloads um, and a community housing specialist that supports a smaller team, um, they're seeing around like 25 to 30 days um, from enrollment to, to homelessness being ended through, through a permanent housing destination. Um, the larger teams with larger caseloads and, and staff turnover, um, staffing has also been an issue during the pandemic. Um, and like Ruth said, I mean, units, we need a lot oh, more units. deeply affordable, sustainable units in high opportunity areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just want to underscore that, Megan, that it's like, we already had a really challenging situation in terms of availability of units and being able to identify landlords that will work with the different organizations and things like that. And that has been significantly compounded across um, the community by the workforce issues. So um, it's you know creating challenges for actually um, you know or expanding time it could take someone to get into into housing um, 
So mm -hmm. if anybody knows anybody that wants a job, check with all of our agencies because yes. we're we're all we're all seeking um, mm -hmm. folks who are committed to these issues and want to work on them. Um, so it's close to one, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I really want to thank our panelists, Shirley, for your uh, deep and honest um, sharing of your story. And we're so glad that you are in your new um, place and have got the supports that you need. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and Megan and Ruth for sharing your knowledge and expertise. We really um, appreciate it. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions we will do what we can to address some of those in the follow-up materials um, after the forum. And thanks to everybody for joining us and we'll see you at the next forum. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks for having us.